You're listening to The Bouquet Toss, the podcast that helps you plan your day your way by helping you figure out what to keep and what to toss from your wedding day plans. Welcome back to The Bouquet Toss. This season, we are both posing and attempting to answer the question, why weddings? One of the biggest whys that a lot of couples face when it comes to marriage is why are weddings so expensive? For real. Right? There's so many reasons for that. So we thought that a constructive way to deal with the fact that weddings are expensive is to give couples amazing resources for managing their finances. Money is a challenge for everyone, so navigating it with a partner comes with its own unique set of challenges. So as you get ready to build a life with your partner, there are some really savvy things that you and your partner can be doing together to set you up for the future you envision having together. Now, we are not necessarily the people that can teach you that. So we have real pros that we tap into to learn about these things. And one of them is with us today. We're going to speak with Emily Luck. Emily is the CEO and co-founder of Plenty. Started by a husband and wife team, Plenty is a wealth platform built for modern couples to invest and plan towards their future together. Previously, she was VP of Strategy and Operations at Even, which was acquired by Walmart. As they scaled to support millions of individuals and move billions of dollars, Prior to that, she was a founding team member of Stripe's growth and finance and strategy teams. So she kind of knows her stuff. She began her career as a VC and was one of the youngest nationally to complete both her CPA and CFA designations. So I venture to say she knows a thing or two. We're so excited to have her here to learn more and to share some of this money knowledge with all of you. So thanks for being here, Emily. Thank you both for having me. To get started, because there's so many things that we want to talk about. Maybe this is simple, maybe not, but what are the three most important money chats that couples should have before getting married? I absolutely love this question. We get asked this all the time, and there's a number of different questions that are helpful to navigate, but also at a time when you're thinking about getting married, potentially also planning a wedding, not trying to bite off too much at the very beginning is also important. So picking just the three chats that we recommend every couple to have. First one, be open and honest about where you each are. I think this is one part that often is the root of starting off your marriage on a really strong foundation where you're not going to blindside to surprise your partner with unexpected, you know, credit card debt that you might have, student loans you might have, or maybe you have, you know, some additional investments that the other partner didn't realize until many years into the marriage. And so this is one place where we actually help you do this really easily. But one thing we recommend is sit down, show, walk through what accounts you're open to sharing with each other, especially when it comes to debts. It is something that we do recommend recommend that you talk about much more openly. And that gives you kind of that foundation to say, okay, we understand where we are independently and together. The second chat we really recommend is what are our values around money? And that can sound like a hard conversation to navigate, but usually the way we talk about this is what is important to you? What do you both care about? And really importantly, if not even actually more important, What do we not care about? What are things that are either items or experience or moments where it's actually not as important to us? So maybe because, you know, money is limited, we'll just put it towards the things we actually both care about. And it's important, I think, to revisit that because it also helps your money go further towards the things that really deeply are meaningful to each of you and together. And then the last chat that we usually recommend before marriage is how did our family think about money? What was it like talking Mm. about money, thinking about money growing up? Because oftentimes it's very natural to just bring the way that your parents thought about money, they approached money, and many people as they enter adulthood either accidentally replicate things that they saw and normalized growing up, or they actually bounce really far in the other direction (laughs) and actually overcorrect their potentially. And so just knowing where it started from helps you actually start to stitch together hey, we're a team. We're building a future together. How are we going to set what we want to do for our family moving forward and just be conscious of each other's experience growing up? 
Now there's more conversations to be had, of course, but like I said, I think it's starting with even just the first conversation makes a big difference. It definitely does. And I think that for all of these things, but specifically when you were talking about your vision or like your values with your money, that's also something that can change. I think that mm -hmm. it, you know, it feels like we want to be able to say like, well, this is me. This is what I think. This is what I believe. But like you and your partner will continue changing together, separately, whatever, you know, both. And what you feel, what you want, what you value is also going to change. And so mm -hmm. I guess it's just right away getting comfortable with the idea that you're going to need to talk about this stuff for the rest of your time together. So mm -hmm. getting you know, finding a way that works for the two of you to enter into the conversation that you both feel comfortable enough to share where you're really at, that's huge. And yeah, like you said, you know, anything in the past or how you grew up, like these are things that consciously or unconsciously affect you no matter what. And I think mm -hmm. it's very interesting to just not even ha make your partner observe it or, or mm -hmm. like have to piece together from things that you tell them about your childhood, but just to mm -hmm. kind of like straight out, like ask each other what it was like, because you might not realize that you yeah. were affected by your parents' money habits. Yeah. And it's, you just got to kind of like talk about it to then even understand yeah. how that affected you. Totally. I think so many relationship therapists talk about the importance of curiosity. So one thing that even for Channing and I, we were trying to remind ourselves like, okay, how do we pretend like maybe actually we're not the direct partner in this conversation? We're just the investigator. We're just trying to understand more. So how can we bring that level of curiosity to invite you know, our partner to share because that just helps us understand who they are and ultimately makes it easier to be a stronger team together. I love that so much. And, you know, just to reiterate, no matter what you might think, like whether or not you think you were, you know, influenced by your family and the way you grew up, like you absolutely were. <laughs> and so like getting to unpack these things together. And I love the idea of like exploring that with curiosity. It should never be coming from a place of judgment, obviously. But the key to any relationship and setting a strong foundation for success, you know, in the long term is being open and honest um, about all of this. So I think that's super, super helpful advice. So being open, being honest, being curious, these are all like kind of ground rules to help you talk about money. Is there anything else that you can think of that kind of we can lay out there for money talks? Yeah, so I think there's one practice that probably even beyond talking about money, just in all relationships and something we try to cultivate, I think when you start to feel your heart rate accelerating <laughs> and that energy, you're like, you know, the frustration or anger or whatever, the strong emotions, like just take a couple of deep breaths. Talking about money is not going to be easy. So when you start to feel that acceleration, just taking a few deep breaths, that usually also prevents one of our next recommendations, which is being really careful around you statements and not making you statements that put your partner in a box. So these are statements like you always do X, Y, Z, or you never do X, Y, Z. And these are always really dangerous because you're not giving space for your partner to grow and to have evolved. And probably also you're talking about one moment that might have frustrated you, but it's not necessarily who they are. But the most important thing your partner can do is also reflect, you know, these are all the great things I think you are or can do. And so one of the things we say is to keep that on the right track generally try to focus on saying, I feel, I think, and it's all about where you are as opposed to imposing anything. I think the, the other thing that we also talk a lot about is meeting vulnerability with vulnerability. And it's really tough when someone reveals something that maybe it does impact you and maybe is uncomfortable. And one of the hardest things is if you respond with anger, then obviously that's a reason for someone to close up. And it's very natural to protect yourself after that. You know, one very common example we have seen couples is when they're starting to navigate the conversation, if one person has not had a chance to admit before that they have a higher student loan balance or they have credit card debt. And this is such a hard topic. And I think when your partner, if your partner does share that with you, the anger, the frustration is not really productive. And one of the things we we try to say is just repeating is like, hey, 
just accept where they are, accept where you are, and figure out a plan to move forward together as a team. And if it's focusing so much on, oh, this is where we're stuck at, you're not really going to be able to make progress or feel like you're working towards a better future together. Absolutely. And I think these are things that should really happen when the relationship gets serious, probably before you're like engaged and talking about your wedding. Um, And so I think that's just helpful for anybody in a relationship. But most of our listeners are at the point where they're engaged, they're, they're wedding planning or they're getting ready to. And so can we take a look at what in that moment, like they're they're in the mode, maybe they're starting to look at venues, maybe they've booked a few vendors, it's that time they're planning their wedding, like what steps can they take then to set themselves up best as they continue down the process of planning? Yeah, and so, you know, I've been there myself, you kind of have this thrill when you get engaged and now you're like, oh, we're planning a wedding. And I think especially when you have all of your friends and family being like, when's the date? Where's the venue? Have you booked it? Have you booked it? And everyone has all these questions. It's really easy to get wrapped up because there are so many details and so much work that goes into planning a wedding. One of the things we recommend is having some time blocked off where actually you explicitly are not thinking about the wedding and you're really talking with your partner about what are the most important goals that we have for the next three or five years. We usually say not too much further out beyond that, but right around that three to five year mark, usually people start to have conversations where maybe they wanna have a kid, maybe they wanna buy a house, maybe they want to do some travel, what maybe they have a home renovation project. Whatever it is, it's helpful to think about the goals that you share together and to take that into perspective when you're starting to think about, hey, for our wedding, which is going to be this magical and very important event, where does this rank and how is this prioritized relative to the other goals we have? When each of you come up with prioritization, it's also okay if there's a different sequence and a different order. I think so much of marriage is like meeting each other and finding like a happy medium where you both are at peace and calm and don't feel like you're going to have a lot of that regret. So we start off with saying usually, what are the other goals? in the next three to five years. And help grounding in the other things are important also gives a framework when you're starting to set a budget with your partner. And you can even start this off by throwing out different numbers. It's like, hey, if we did this, you know, and when we put an extra 10,000 into the wedding, what does this mean for when we're going to buy a house? This is actually something that our platform does really easily where you can actually see, oh, if I put 10,000 more, however much more towards these different goals, How does that impact other things that I might want to do? And visualize, what is this going to feel like one month after the wedding? And maybe that feeling is, yeah, you know what? I think it's completely worth it. And great. Now you actually have created the space to really feel that calm. And hopefully it also means during the wedding planning process and after the wedding, you feel like, okay, we were really thoughtful about this decision and we made the right decision here. The hard part is, I think, when sometimes people are not as able to think about the other goals they have. And we've talked to couples where there's this intense regret right after the wedding, which is the bills start to come in and they're like, that was more than I thought it would be, which usually is a little bit more than you thought it would be. And then they're like, oh, maybe that was too much, but you can't change it at that point. And so just as much as you are able to have that conversation with your partner and also be honest about what's important, If it is important to have a bigger wedding or have more people there, then do it and make that decision with intentionality. And if it's less important or you want something, maybe you're like, oh, maybe we'll have a slightly smaller wedding or we'll have, you know, uh, like less bells and whistles for it or we'll DIY it more, then at least you've been able to think about the wedding relative to also the rest of your life. Hey Savvies, we know money talks can be overwhelming, so before Emily dives into her biggest suggestions for saving and investing as a couple, we want to take a quick break to share one of our biggest suggestions for saving and investing when it comes to wedding planning. One wedding investment you can guarantee a return on is investing in your own creativity. In partnership with our friends at Cricut, we're taking a quick look at the ultimate savvy companion for DIY brides, a smart cutting machine that you can use not only for your big day, but for many years to come. 
So with us to discuss is Avani Patel, Director of Marketing and Acquisition at Cricket. So we're going to get right to it. Let's talk about finances. How does investing in a Cricket machine help couples save money for their wedding and beyond? Hi. Yeah. So investing in a Cricket, I always say a wedding is the perfect impetus to start your Cricket journey, right? That is the time where you have a checklist that's a mile long. You've got a billion things that you got a budget for. And the coolest thing is how much you can make with your Cricut machine. That you can actually save a lot more money by making instead of buying. I have seen so much creativity. I wish I had had or known about a Cricut machine when I was getting married. That was seven, eight years ago now. But everything from invitations to place cards to all of the cool signage that you see at weddings. I mean, honestly, if you go on Etsy and you type in wedding, all of that stuff is powered by Cricut machines. So I actually say that's kind of the beginning of the journey and you kind of use your machine a lot at that point. But I don't think a lot of people know that after you get married, there is so many more occasions that you could be using your Cricut machine too. Absolutely. So let's just talk about all of those things. What are those occasions that you would use this for? Yeah, so there are just so many milestones, right, um, after your wedding. People think that's kind of like the big one, and then the next one is having kids, but there's so much more in between that. I remember when we bought our first home, I whipped out my Cricut machine a lot then, too. Like, our welcome mat is a Cricut creation. Any kind of pillowcases I have or blankets, I've also put the Cricut flair on those as well. Think about anything in your house that you might want personalized. I also feel like I'm way more organized now with my Cricut. Our pantry has everything labeled with Cricut labels. Mm -hmm. Laundry machine. Uh, um, love that. Bathroom. <laughs> I mean, possibilities are endless from like the emotional fun stuff to the functional stuff. I feel like I use it a lot for just getting our home kind of set up and turning that house to a home. I love that because a lot of what we're focused on like financially with weddings is how it fits into everything else that you want goals wise in your life. Yep. And, you know, like we did an episode this season with one of our friends at Zillow mm -hmm. talking about just how you navigate, like if, if home buying is also a priority for you and you're planning your wedding. Absolutely. And so as you're going about budgeting and figuring out what you can afford, especially around home buying, it, the ability to have something like right at your fingertips that can check so many boxes is so cool. You know, like it's not just one of those things like we talk about, like on your wedding day, if you invest in which like something that I did, I got cookies mm -hmm. that I gave out to everybody as favors from like our favorite place that we always got cookies. And it meant something to us and to a lot of people there. Like no one can reuse that. <laughs> And like for that price, I could have purchased a cricket machine. And great point. <laughs> but I couldn't. You can't bake with it. So, sure, sure. <laughs> but you know, so there's there's just a lot. I think there's like it feels good to know when you're doing something that like you can get use for in a lot of different ways. And we've you know gone over and over how a wedding is not that, but this part of your wedding could be absolutely. People might be thinking, oh, maybe I'm not crafty, I'm not artsy, like all levels are able to do this. But the thing you don't realize like about it as a money saver is that if you're buying, let's say, a bridesmaid proposal box, right. right? You're paying 30 something dollars for something that you could create for less than 10. Minimum, right? And minimum, right? right. Like you are every time you have to order something and you're paying for shipping and you're paying for somebody else's labor and you're paying taxes and all of these things, it adds up so quickly. 100%. When you have to buy presents, you every holiday, maybe you want to decorate your home, you want to change it from Halloween to Easter to all the things. Like anytime you want to do that, you're buying all these things, you're buying new and cutting into your body. Absolutely. And you touched on such an amazing thing, which is when you buy those things like the bridesmaid proposal box, you can spend all that time and money and it's still not going to feel unique or different to you. And I think that's what Cricut really allows you to do. Perfect example is I live close to my three sisters and we have a huge family and we're constantly gathering. We're constantly doing things for the big events like Halloween, Christmas, and then also the small stuff too. 
And no matter what it is, I can add that personal flair. I still have, talk about reusable, I have these reusable glasses and I have everyone's names with vinyl decals on them. I pull that out all the time, especially now that there's like kids and the family and stuff. They love having something that's personal to them. It was just Easter. We had Easter baskets for everybody. It just makes every moment more special and it shows, it's kind of how I show my family I care. And look, I definitely don't think I'm the craftiest person, but it has become such a, Cricut has so many resources for you. And if you YouTube Cricut, like you will see so many tutorials, like they've got your back, you will figure out how to use it. But it's just so cool to kind of have that little edge or thing that makes it unique. And, and the gift feels really personal, or your home feels really personal, depending on what you're doing. Totally. And I, I really feel like too, it can't be overstated, like how much the cricket really comes in as like MVP and in a pinch. (laughs) If you're in a last minute moment, like, oh no, I need a card for this, or I need a gift for this. Like you can whip something up so so quick with stuff you already have at home. So true. And so it can be a real lifesaver too. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I, I remember how proud I was of myself because I remember my sister had her first baby and we were going to take her to the pumpkin patch. And I was like, well, I know you have her in a cute outfit right and she's like no I don't have anything I put together the cutest pumpkin in the past with her name on it in like five minutes like it was still worn from the press so I'm like taking it to the car (laughs) so like that's where it really can come at the pinch yeah my sister's probably gonna not like me for saying this but she you know you forget a lot of kids birthdays until you have to show up in an hour and not your own kids oh my gosh (laughs) your kids friends right you could there's birthday parties every weekend And she's like, oh, my God, I don't have a gift. But, like, she's been able to stock up on things like backpacks or, Mm -hmm. you know, jean jackets. She's amazing at making jean jackets with, like, lots of different things on them. Jealous. And personalizing them. And it's probably one of the better gifts that that kid's getting anyway. Totally. I'm in that life stage where all of my friends are having babies right now. I don't think I've bought a single gift. I've made onesies. I've made those baby boxes. I made those little like milestone cards that have like wood signs because you can cut things like wood on your Cricut as well. But all of those things I think just feels like so personal. It's not just when I give those to my friends that are having babies, but they're also like that amazement on in their face. So they're like, you made this. Like that to me is one of the coolest things that you can do with your Cricut. And that's like not even the financial s- savings that, you know, obviously I've saved a lot Mm -hmm. of money not buying for every single friend, you know, a dedicated baby gift, but being able to make it at home. Yeah, there is like, the options are almost limitless of what you can do with a Cricut. I'm going to run down just a quick list of like little bits of inspiration, but there's so much more than we're going to even get here. But anything like decorating your new home, welcome mats, pillows, hosting friends and family for big events, for small events, Halloween, holidays, Easter, Friendsgiving, maybe you put everybody's name like in vinyl on their wine glass so that everybody knows which one they're drinking from that night. Welcoming a baby, you can DIY nursery decor, framed artwork, baby onesies, as you said, celebrating birthdays. You can make all these cute little things. It's Instagrammable, but on a budget and Cricut can do it all. So we can't sing their praises enough. And thank you, Evany, for being with us to share your insight and all the amazing things Cricut can do. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, if you want to know more about all the amazing things that Cricut can do for you, visit Cricut.com. I really like how you pointed out giving yourself kind of a time frame to look at because I do think there are stages. Like if you, if you do look at it and you're like, well, you know, if our immediate goal is really to buy a house, but we would prefer to do the wedding first. And we also really want this type of wedding. How will you feel when the house is inevitably moved back in the timeline? Mm -hmm. Because then it gives you permission to remember that this is forever, right? Like the idea Mm -hmm. is that you and your partner are starting out this life together. And so the fact that you can't hit every goal likely Mm -hmm. in immediate secession that's okay and kind of beautiful because you get to work with your partner on it and so kind of like deciding together I know like my fiance and I did that we kind of like said like you know what is like the order like you know do we want to move get engaged get married do we want to get engaged first then move and you know you need to have an idea but so you keep mentioning your platform, right? That helps people organize this and think about it. And we did mention up top plenty, but can you just give us a deeper dive into what plenty is and why you built it? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to share that. 
So Plenty is a wealth platform for modern couples. And my husband and I decided to start building Plenty um, after we got engaged. So each of us, we spent about a decade each in Silicon Valley working at different startups, primarily fintech startups. And after you know we got engaged, we had the experience where we assumed, we were like, oh, so many people have gotten married before. Of course, there's going to be ways, easy platforms that should have been built for other couples like us. Especially nowadays, a lot of modern couples, there's much more of this threading of the needle for how do we build together, do life together, but also feel like we're also able to be independent, but we're also a unit. And that was one thing where, especially in finances, that usually plays out in terms of people taking steps towards merging their finances, but it's not like all at once we change everything overnight the day we got married. And so we started thinking a lot more about what are the things that couples need support with and what do we want to exist even for ourselves to think about our finances. And our platform today makes it possible where you can each connect all of your own accounts. You can then set any of the accounts to be private because many couples have a private credit card or a private bank account. It's like, hey, you know, we can do whatever we want with the money there. For all the other accounts, we make it possible for you to really easily share visibility with your partner. So it's easy to understand where you are today. We then also take for all of your bank accounts and cards, we'll also do an analysis to say, hey, what are you spending as an individual? And what are you spending together? So you can see, oh, you know, this is roughly what is tracking like month over month for us eating out at restaurants. And then we also make it really simple for you to say, these are our shared goals. What are we working towards together? Maybe we wanna save for a wedding, we wanna save for a house, maybe we also have a vacation, we also have a sibling who's getting married and we'll do a bigger wedding gift there. And so you can easily set up all of your goals that are either shared goals or individual goals, and then we'll actually recommend what's the best and easiest way for you to save and invest towards those goals. We will actually help you also figure out what is the right portfolio. So it's as simple as a couple steps where you can just say yes or no effectively and you can get up and running. So we did this really because we we saw that for so many couples, it's hard enough trying to figure out finances on your own, but it's so much harder when you're doing it with a partner. And we really thought about how we could design an experience where it makes it less scary, less intimidating every step along the way. I think this is so smart. I think you 100% found a hole in the market and filled it because, yes, I think budgeting is so important, but there's tons of things out there that can help you budget. And a lot of people are, you know, at least in like our generation, have kind of gotten used to using an app for it, right? But Mm -hmm. the fact that it's there's help with investing, Mm -hmm. like at your fingertips with yes or no questions, I mean, that I think is... It sounds pretty savvy to me. <laughs> it sounds exactly because investing in general needs to be demystified. It's definitely set up the way it is on purpose so that people who know it and understand it can like work the system for themselves. And it there's often like a whole opportunity of money being left on the table for those that don't know how to interact with it. Mm-hmm. And so I just think it's incredible to be empowering couples to work together to do that because it does make a big difference when you are looking at years down the line you know like immediate goals and even if your wedding is a year or two years out it is pretty immediate there's things that you can do with putting your you know expenses on a credit card and maybe getting points or Mm -hmm. often you you've saved the money before you're doing this because it's like a short-term thing Mm -hmm. but meanwhile what are you doing for the long term and how can you do both at the same time? And we keep having this conversation this season. It's like weddings are really expensive, but people are still having them. Like we're not going to stop that. And as much as everyone can think of 800 other things that they could spend the money on, it's still like a short term investment that people want to have. And so how do you make it easier But how do you make it fit into the rest of your life and not just be, you know, you have these financial goals and it's for a year out and you're then like, we'll start over after that. 
because that's not good. Yeah. And, you know, weddings are, I think, such an important and helpful ritual because one of the symbolism of symbolic pieces for it is that your friends and family, those that are closest to you, are there to bear witness that you are committing yourself to growing with each other and to building a life together. Right. And I think that's also why I personally don't think weddings are going to go away anytime soon, because there's that failing of community that I think is just so core to human nature. At the same time, what we hear from a lot of couples who start to use plenty when they are planning for a wedding is especially because it's so expensive. Now is really the time to be like, okay, let's really understand where are we? What can we afford? How much do you have in your accounts? What about me? Okay, I can actually, this will save for the house and I really don't want to dip into that. So maybe we, you know, just use this other bucket and you can start to have these conversations, especially when it is such a big milestone. One of the other things that you said that really resonated too was, I think in so many relationships, it's very natural. And actually one of the financial therapy associ uh, associations and researchers actually said there's usually about an 80 to 85 percent of relationships one person does more in managing the finances than the other person mm. that's very natural but for a lot of relationships if the other person at least can be a passenger and using that analogy like you gotta be in the car you gotta at least know where you're going you're part of the decision too you don't have to drive the equal amount but at least you know where are the accounts what do we have what you know direction we're going into UBS had a really great study called an Own Your Worst study, and they found out that the stat was for people who had been unexpectedly widowed or divorced, 95% of ladies wish they had been more involved in their finances earlier. When they are both involved in finances, the statistics were, I think, both surprising and not fully surprising, but they were talking about how you as a couple, you feel more secure, you are happier. You are less likely to make decisions that are considered mistakes for when you're thinking about investments or budget decisions because you're making the decision as a team. And so I think that's also one of the things that we see as an opportunity where for so many, weddings are really your first time to team up on something that large. And there are so many financial pieces, but it's just the first of many financial things you will inevitably do with your partner. It's so true. And one thing I wanted to ask um, just about some like features of Plenty. So that's the other part that's important is not just do we help people with uh, within relationships think about their money, but also we take the perspective that for many couples, they're looking at overall trends. They're not really thinking quite as much about, you know, spending $14 too much on coffee in the last month. It is a lot more about the big picture. Then the other thing that we do that is important is we make it really easy for you to not only understand where is your spending going, but spending is just the other side of the coin for how much are you able to then save and are you actually investing that? Because if your money is just sitting in a checking account and it's not growing, it's actually getting less valuable, especially with this inflation rate. And so we also make it really easy where you can see all of that in one place. And then maybe you spent less in a month and you're like, I'm going to invest that. And you actually put your money to work for you. That's a lot of how we think about, you know, when you're managing your money, these are the most important products and features that you really do need to have in one place. That sounds super helpful. And just, I think any sort of tracking system that allows you to see like money in versus money out and like see actually where your money is going every month. Like I think it encourages more mindfulness about your spending habits and like the things that you do on a day to day basis, which can add up over time, especially like you said, if you have that extra left over at the end of the month, putting it into an investment account instead of just letting it sit there. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I think a lot of the future that we see and we also think is best for consumers is really a world in which your data won't be sold. So we think a lot about data privacy. We are a paid product, but that really just enables us to continue building up the product while you're still able to, you know, be able to get all this great functionality, see and manage everything in one place. But it also protects you in terms of not having to then also potentially have your data sold, potentially be targeted by mail or advertisements, and also not being just shown as many, you know, products that you could potentially use. So true. What's what was the name of that Netflix special that was like all about Facebook and basically like social dilemma, the social dilemma. Yes, it's, it's yeah. just like in the social dilemma. Like if you're not 
paying for the product, you are the product. And like your data is being used by those companies in some way you're being targeted for ads and offers and things like that. So it's such a great point. I love that. There's so many great things here. And I think like above all, the, the best part about it is that it's making it accessible, making it feel controllable as you get married. And like you take this big step. It's I literally keep saying, my fiance is going to kill me. I'm like, I feel like a child. Like, I'm a child bride. Like, <laughs> I am not. How am I going to be married? How is this even? And it's, like, so funny because I have, like, my parents are, like, we still feel like children. Like, you never stop yep. feeling that way. But, like, mm-hmm. when you have to do these big financial things, you you need to understand it. Like, you, you can still be a kid if you want at heart, but you have to be able to understand it. And, like, the education piece is one thing, but the access is, I think, even more important. And so I just think that that's a wonderful thing that you guys are doing. And that said, you know, so you, let's say you're a couple, you get to the point where you have been having really strong money talks and, you know, you've set out your goals and now you've planned your wedding and maybe even you've hit that day and now you're married. And so I don't imagine that much changes in terms of you still need open, honest communication. You need to have curiosity, Mm -hmm. but is there anything that now being married that couples can take advantage of from a financial standpoint? Yeah. So first, what, about 85% of couples will open up a joint account for the first time around in the couple of years around marriage. So that's very normal. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're both depositing your paychecks right out the gate day one, because that's a really big step. And for a lot of couples, especially when they've been working for a number of years, they're used to a certain degree of independence, even the early months and years in a marriage is, hey, let's just dip our toes into it. So we'll open up our first joint account and maybe we'll just use that to start saving towards our home down payment. And maybe we're just going to say, hey, we have this agreement that you earn more than I do, so you'll put in a little bit more and I'll put in you know, roughly the same percentage. That's usually what we see a lot of times, either is equal or a similar percentage. And we both put it into this joint account for this goal. Then what we see actually is over time, there is this gradual comfort with, oh, maybe actually, you know, we will put more of our paychecks into this. Or maybe we have bigger financial things we're looking to do, like we got the house and now we're paying the mortgage out of it. And people start to redirect more of their paycheck. Or the other version that we see a lot of times is that people redirect their paychecks into this joint account and they give themselves each an allowance. And that's like a great way to also maintain some of your independence and be like, this is just money where you can each do whatever you want. You wanna invest it, you wanna spend it, you wanna gift it, whatever you want. There's some portion, I think psychologically, it's also helpful from a relationship perspective because it makes it really easy to maintain that independence and also maintain that perspective that not 100% needs approval. Not 100% needs to be completely, you know, we both agree on every single thing or else the other person doesn't do it. And I think that's also a healthy part of figuring out your own identity within relationship. So that's something that we usually see as, you know, up as practically just, just starting to talk about, hey, do we want to open up our first joint account? If we do, what do we want to start with? And I would say, you know, for those conversations, it's a starting point. You don't have to set everything up, get it all wired day one. But an important part is if you're not ready to really be sharing kind of all of the money, like moving everything into the same set of accounts, that sharing visibility is a really good first step. Whether that's sharing visibility over some of the credit cards or debit cards, sharing visibility into some of the investment accounts. Again, it doesn't have to be all or nothing, but just starting and setting that up as, hey, we'll revisit. We'll also revisit, you know, whether or not we want to share more information, move more money into the shared accounts and shared goals, then that's usually what we see, especially as the initial steps. So important, I feel like, all of these conversations, especially for for people of our generation, right? The millennials, the Gen Zs, like we're saddled with more student loan debt than like any previous generation. We're navigating recessions after recession and, and all these things, all these different like topics related to money are inevitable. They're inescapable. And so anything that helps like demystify and like navigate and like clearly show your progress as you're working towards these goals. I mean, that's just seems invaluable to me. Thank you. I, I think, you know, it's so important also in these conversations to remember you're a team. You got married to be a team. And if you're able to then use that and point out, hey, 
there's a debt that we have that we're going to work down together, that's a much more constructive conversation than pointing at each other to be like, you have this debt. And it's like, you're not really going to go anywhere productive. <laughs> um, externally, not fast, right? And it's definitely going to be pretty unhealthy for some time if that's the approach. Or maybe there is an income disparity, but at the end of the day, you're a team and you're building a future that you're going to share together. So how do you work as a team? And if that means that one person just feels safer, maybe it was because they grew up uh, a certain way, maybe because they've been used to managing their money a certain way. And if it makes them feel a little bit safer to be like, hey, I just, it feels better to have some money and more money in an account under my name. I'm still working on, you know, thinking about us. And I think that's also one thing about us, like, you know, this nowadays in this day and age for getting married, it can feel very sudden. And so all of a sudden also expecting, hey, every single thing you do is going to be rewired and changed upon marriage. That's pretty intimidating. So just taking it slowly, one step at a time, moving intentionally through it, I think is also such an important foundation for, for your marriage and for your life together. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. So this has been really awesome. I think just everyone listening probably is going to immediately just want to <laughs> check out Plenty. Um, but okay, I'm going to have a challenge for you. You have 30 seconds mm -hmm. to give us like wrap up our whole conversation into like top key tips for navigating money in your marriage. Okay, ready? Go probably biased, but I'd say the first one is to use plenty, <laughs> but or at least use something where it makes it really easy to focus on the goals that you're working towards together and to share visibility and transparency. Money dates and money talks are not easy or natural, and it's not something we're ever taught how to do. And so just start and know that it's going to get easier over time. Make it as fun as possible. Wear silly onesies, play your favorite music, have a glass of wine, treat yourself with a reward at the end so you know you have something to look forward to now that you've done more of the work. Just like consistency and just starting that as a habit. I love that. Um, I think uh, naked money dates are probably maybe a good incentive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we would get necessarily to the end of the bunny talks. <laughs> Got to keep it spicy. Whatever in your marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever Absolutely. makes it fun. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Emily. Um, before we go, just give everybody an idea of where they can find more about you, more about Plenty, all of that stuff. Yeah, great question. So I'm sure that there will be a link shared with the podcast. We are also at www.withplenty.com. Plenty Financial is also on Instagram, TikTok, all the platforms. And so you can also find more material to learn more about us. Amazing. Great. Thank you so much for being here, Emily. Thank you guys so much for having me. Love that. You've been listening to The Bouquet Toss, brought to you by TheBudgetSavvyBride.com. For more tips, tricks, hacks, inspiration, and support, check out the links in our show notes. We are a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Get more information and check out other shows in the network by visiting evergreenpodcasts.com.